On June 19, 1980, the Munich Philharmonic held auditions for solo trombone. In the first round of auditions, 33 men auditioned behind a screen. Then it was Candidate 16's turn, and everyone was stunned by his performance. They believed he was the one. In the second round, done without a screen, there was visible shock to see that Candidate 16 was a woman, 30-year-old Abby Conant. After outplaying everyone else in rounds two and three, she won the audition. The orchestra's director, Sergiu Chilipadaki, believed she was one of the finest trombonists he had ever heard. Except, he didn't want to hire her, but because he was new in his job and still undergoing contract negotiations, he wasn't in a position to overrule the orchestra's decision. As a result, Abby Conant won the job. But here's the twist. On her application for the job she just won, she addressed herself as Herr or Mr. Abby Conant as opposed to Frau or Mrs. Abby Conant. Abby lying about her sex could have disqualified her because how can you trust someone if the first impression they give is lying about themselves? But that didn't bother anyone because everyone knew she was the better player. But even then, why wasn't the HR person reading her application for the job. Perplexed by this from the get-go, Abby is actually a nickname for Abraham, which is used to describe men, and since Abby is also often used to describe women, makes it a unisex name. Now that Abby won her job, her next task was delivering in performance, and deliver, she did. After getting no complaint in her probation year, she secured her tenure position. But if you look at some Munich Philharmonic videos from the 1980s, you'll find that she wasn't playing first chair. That's because she was forced out of first. Why did this happen? Stick around as I tell you the story of one of the most scandalous instances of orchestra mismanagement. Welcome to the Trauma Channel. I hope you enjoy. <laughs> Before we begin, we need to talk about three things. Abby Conant, the Munich Philharmonic, and Sergiu Chilipidaki. Abby Conant was born on March 14, 1955, and grew up in Tesuque, a small town located just north of New Mexico's capital, Santa Fe. At the age of 15, in the summer of 1970, she attended the National Music Camp of Interlaken in northern Michigan. While doing so, she got a scholarship to the famed Interlaken Arts Academy, which she attended for three years. At the age of 18, she married her husband, William Osborne, who would later become known for theater work. Abby began studying with Carl Hinter Bickler at New Mexico University, but she then got her undergraduate degree from Temple University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where she studied with Dee Stewart of the Philadelphia Orchestra. And in 1979, she got her master's degree at the Juilliard School, studying with Per Brevig, principal trombone of the Met Opera. But during her time in school, she also had five additional engagements at several music festivals around the country, including getting an artist diploma from a school in Germany, as well as playing with a training orchestra in Colorado. It wouldn't be until the summer of 1979, when she became first trombonist of the Spolito Music Festival of the Two roles in Italy, where she also studied contemporary music with French composer Vinco Globocar. Having received tutelage from many talented trombonists and musicians, it would take no time at all for her to make some noise. Later in 1979, she auditioned for the solo trombone position of the Maggio Musicale Orchestra Florence and won. Except, its Italian music director, Riccardo Muti, who wasn't even there at the audition, vetoed her appointment, stating, too many women in the orchestra. Several within the orchestra were outraged over this. Many didn't believe he would do this, but in an article in Italy's edition, of Vanity Fair, posted June 29, 2021, he expressed a common dismissive argument about hashtag MeToo, basically saying, yeah, that whole diversity thing, forget about it. Let's instead focus on talent. Abby's dismissal didn't stop her from winning another audition as principal trombone of the Royal Opera of Turin, Italy, and actually got it. But she didn't like their style of music, so she applied to 11 trombone positions on the German union magazine Das Orchester. The only one who wrote back was the Munich Philharmonic, who probably said, thank you, Mr. Abby Conant, looking forward to your audition on June 19, 1980. The Munich Philharmonic was founded in 1893 by Franz Keim and was known as the Keim Orchestra. Their strategy for success included making their concerts affordable to all levels of society as well as maintaining very high standards. From 1898 to 1905, Felix Weingartner took the orchestra on tours to several countries, enhancing its international reputation. This led to Gustav Mahler premiering his fourth and eighth symphonies. Six months after his death in 1911, the orchestra, now named Concert Verein Orchestra, premiered The Song of the Earth. From 1908 to 1914, a student of Anton Bruckner, Ferdinand Lowe, took over the helm. The orchestra premiered most of Bruckner's work, and as a result, made it a tradition to play his music every year, something the orchestra is now best known for. Their next director, Siegmund von Hausiger, led the group from 1920 to 1938, and in the process, changed the orchestra's name to the Munich Philharmonic. In 1933, following the rise of the Nazi party, the Munich Philharmonic labeled all of its music with the Orchestra of the Fascist Movement. Then in 1938, a very pro-Nazi conductor, Oswald Kabasta, took 
took the helm. During World War II, the orchestra continued business as usual, except they, like the rest of Germany, banned all of Mendelssohn's work since he was Jewish. This ban ended immediately after World War II in 1945, when they played his composition, A Midsummer Night's Dream, at their very next concert. After the fall of the Nazi party, the words were removed from their scores, except the symbol with the swastika remained all the way until 1991, when William Osborne requested it to be removed. 22 years later in 1967, after several changes in leadership, Rudolf Kemp became their conductor. What's unique about Rudolf Kemp was that when he worked with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, he abolished its founder's male-only rule, allowing women to become members. This was because he felt that an orchestra without women, quote, always reminded me of the army. He applied this to the Munich Philharmonic, where one audition was done with a screen. The winner was a woman in the wind section. The second time was Thursday, June 19th, 1980. But that wasn't before Sergiu Chilipidaki took the helm. Sergio Chilipidaki was born on June 28, 1912, in the small city of Roman, found in northeastern Romania. His father later became an official within the Romanian government and advised his son to pursue politics in the country, except Sergio went against his wishes and enrolled in the Hochschule for Music in Berlin in 1936. He later got his doctoral studies at Berlin's Friedrich Wilhelm University and got his degree in 1944 after completing a dissertation on Josquin Desprez. But even though he was born a Christian Orthodox, he learned about Zen Buddhism during his time in Berlin, which would end up influencing the rest of his life. Without Zen, I couldn't have known this strange principle that the beginning is the end. Music is nothing but the materialization of this principle. He also conducted several student ensembles and even won first prize at a conducting competition. After World War II, Leo Borchardt was going to become the next music director of the Berlin Philharmonic, except he lost his life due to a miscommunication of hand signals when attempting to cross Checkpoint Charlie, a cross point in the Berlin Wall. As a result, Sergiu Chilibadaki became its music director in 1946. 33 years later, in 1979, after being music director of several orchestras and appearing with several more, he was appointed music director of the Munich Philharmonic. In general, the further down south you go, the worse it gets. As someone who twice went to Europe for school, I can personally attest to this. When we were in Greece one day, me and a few friends were walking around when an older man said this to my friend Aaron, Hello, baby! When we visited monasteries, we were supposed to wear long pants, but I remember at one of them, they were fine with the guys wearing shorts, but not girls. But Germany is an exception to the north-south thing, because it is one of the most patriarchal societies in all of Europe. It has also been said that the southern parts of Germany are far more conservative. Munich, being the most southernmost big city in Germany, makes it about as worse as it gets. Not only that, since Chilibadaki was born and raised in Romania, also one of the most patriarchal societies in Europe, it's likely he carried a sense of male-dominating chauvinism to his new job at the Munich Philharmonic. Therefore, seeing a woman in a leadership position, it would only be a matter of time before he took matters into his own hands. Sergio Chilibadaki wanted to fire Abby, but he knew he couldn't do so out of fear of retaliation. Instead, he came up with a compromise. In May of 1981, Abby was called to a meeting with a group of men led by the bass trombonist of the orchestra, Robert Meissner. Their message to her was this. Chilibadaki wanted to veto her trial year and demote her to second trombone. Needing only two written criticisms to officially do so, they didn't have any. Not only that, her trial year already ended. But despite all that, the director insisted on the veto. Abby had two options. The first was taking her employer, the city of Munich, population 1.3 million, to court. That is because the Munich Philharmonic is a municipal orchestra and gets direct funding from the city itself, so she asked the German Musicians Union what would happen if she did so. Even though they would agree to pay her legal expenses, they said litigation would take at least five years, and in the process of doing so, she would have to give in to her boss's demands, which would have meant playing second trombone and doing more work for a much lesser pay. But not only does the continental law state that the accused supply proof, she would also have to validate her claims with her colleagues. Abby didn't know why her boss was trying to break his own rules, so she chose the second option, reaching a compromise. In doing so, she asked Chilibadaki for a second trial year to hopefully clear things up, because she doesn't want trouble. At the beginning of the next concert season, she played one concert under him as first trombonist, and then for the rest of the season, prohibited her from playing first chair. On February 3rd, 1982, not even before the second trial year ended, Abby received a letter from the orchestra demoting her to second trombone, still with no criticisms levied against her, essentially saying, it's my way or the highway. Abby 
took the highway and took her employer to court. Their first hearing set on August 17th, 1982, was very short. They didn't specify any criticisms, so the judge told them to specify their accusations and scheduled the next hearing 10 months later. Abby Conant continued to play second trombone. Later in November, Abby met with Chalabadaki to make a second attempt at making a compromise to clear up whatever beef he had with her because she just wants everyone to hold hands and sing Kumbaya. Her offer was to play second under him, but solo under everyone else. He rejected the offer and made it official to her for the first time. He said to her, you know the problem. We need a man for the solo trombone. The orchestra gave her little reason to fight the good fight. She was forced to move away because an orchestra official warned her that the county of Munich might not renew her foreigner residence permit. Her support within the orchestra wasn't great either. A rumor was circulated that if Chilibadaki left because of her, a raise in the orchestra's salary would be lost. On December 15th, 1982, she was invited to a meeting with seven members of orchestra leadership, all representing Chilibadaki, but this time, Abby brought a lawyer with her. The lawyer asked what compromise they were willing to offer, but they didn't have any. Instead, they just told her to drop her case because she had no chance and your nerves will never hold out. The same person then accused Abby of refusing to come to work 20 days later, but then she proved they lied about it. Before the second hearing began in June of 1983, the orchestra wrote to the court in February, stating their reason for her demotion, basically saying she's not strong enough to play solo trombone. They also claimed that she lacked the necessary lung capacity, so Abby went to receive testing at the Gautinger Lung Clinic. This was what she had to do. She had to breathe inside a sealed cabin and have blood taken from her ear to see how efficiently her body absorbed oxygen. She had to blow through numerous machines to measure the capacity of her lungs and the speed at which she could inhale and exhale air. She had to disrobe and let a doctor examine her rib cage and chest. The results of the testing can be summarized by this question asked by a nurse. Are you an athlete? The second hearing began on June 16, 1983. This time, Chalibadaki was there with his lawyers. Once again, they didn't give any good reason why they demoted her, so the judge ruled their testimony pointless. They then argued, and the judge let them know that at the end of the day, it was Chalibadaki's word against over 40 recognized musicians and testimonials Abby listed in her brief. At the end of the second hearing, the judge gave them one more opportunity to present specific evidence nine and a half months later. But on July 6, 1983, the orchestra's administration wrote to Abby saying that she was not qualified to play second trombone, and that's just it. They just insulted her for no reason. Finally, at the third hearing on March 29th, 1984, the orchestra still gave no valid reason to demote Abby to second trombone. The court then ruled in favor of Abby. They basically said the demotion was unjustified, no facts were presented, no dates were given, so we don't know what she did wrong. Almost three years after Chilibadaki first wanted to veto Abby's probation year, this would have marked the end of her fight for equal opportunity. But this was not nearly the end of it. That's because it went on for 10 more years. Following the conclusion of the first court case, the city of Munich appealed the decision, and later in the winter of 1984, Chilibadaki, outraged by the outcome of said court case, which concluded several months prior, left the Munich Philharmonic all of a sudden. His departure caused a massive financial loss for the city of Munich. Because of this, the orchestra wanted him so bad that they made compromises. What compromises did they make? I don't know. The article doesn't say. But in any case, after several weeks, Chilibadaki was back at the helm. His history of gender discrimination was not limited to just Abby Conant. It was routine behavior he displayed to many many women. He once referred to German violinist and Sophie Mutter as a violin playing chicken. A mother's group of the Munich Philharmonic wanted to discuss employer guaranteed benefits including unpaid vacations, to which Chilibadaki said, if you wanted children, you chose the wrong profession. Not only that, when the orchestra's new concert hall opened in 1985, it did not include a woman's locker room. At the 1988 Schleswig-Holstein Music Festival, he removed Anja Trotwein from the concert mistress position, saying, only men on the first dance. And in an interview with the evening paper in 1984, he said this, These people who daily poison everything should take a pause or write about gynecology. In that area, everyone has a little experience. But in music, they are virgins, so they will remain, and so they will go into the other world, never fertilized by a single experienced tone. Because the city of Munich appealed the court's decision, Abby Conant continued to play second trombone. The appeal hearings began on February 15, 1985, ten and a half months after the court made their decision, but this time, the orchestra did their homework, at least somewhat. They claimed to have witnessed obvious short-windedness when she played Tuba Miram from Mozart's Requiem, but they overlooked the fact that the Israeli guest conductor, Yoav Talmi, had written her a glowing testimonial, specifically mentioning the solo. But since the judge said he knew nothing about music, it was decided that Abby be auditioned by a third 
third party to see if she was actually qualified for a job, something she already proved in her successful audition for the orchestra almost five years prior. In order to find a candidate to hear that mock audition, both sides supplied their lists for the judge to pick from. Abby listed all conductors from Germany's 95 state orchestras and some trombone professors. The orchestra's list had no conductors and two trombonists, both of whom were competing with Abby for a professorship at the Munich Conservatory, something Abby never ended up getting. But despite the fact the court was willing to pay someone $2,200 to do so, which today is double that, the concern was that if the evaluator ruled in Abby's favor, they would not receive future work with the Munich Philharmonic. As a result, it took a year for someone to reach out, and that someone was Paul Schreckenberger, professor of trombone at the State Conservatory in Mannheim, who on March 3rd, 1986, agreed to do the evaluation. After the judge recommended dates, Schreckenberger said he could do it by June 22nd. He also said it should be taped and done so in the orchestra's concert hall. The city insisted she also be evaluated while playing in the orchestra on June 4th and 5th, which he agreed to do. Schreckenberger then canceled at the last minute and wanted to move the evaluation to September. By the end of that month, there was still no word from him. It wasn't until May 15th, 1987 when it was said that Schreckenberger could do it by the first week of June. Only six days later, he phoned the orchestra saying he couldn't come, and then on July 2nd, he completely backed out of the deal. Two and a half years after the court had decided on a specialist, they still had no one to do the evaluation. The court then contacted someone the city named Professor Michael Stern, but he refused because of self-admitted prejudice. Wow, looks like Abby dodged a bullet there. The court then contacted a third professor by the name of Heinz Fadel. He was the president of the German-speaking Trombone Association and professor of trombone at the University of Music in Detmold. He accepted the offer, and on February 25th, three years after the court first asked for an evaluation, Abby Conant finally got the chance to prove herself. After a very intense mock audition, far more intense than any other ordinary orchestral audition, Heinz Fadel reached this conclusion. She is a wind player with an outstandingly well-trained armature, that is, lip musculature, that enables her to produce a controlled tone production in connection with a controlled breath flow, and which gives her the optimal use of her breath volume. Her breathing technique is very good, and makes her playing, even in the most difficult passages, superior and easy. In this audition, she showed sufficient physical strength, endurance, and breath volume, and above and beyond that, she has enormously solid nerves. This, paired with the above-mentioned wind playing qualities, puts her completely completely in the position to play the most difficult phrases in a top orchestra, holding them out according to the conductor's directions for adequate length and intensity, as well as strength. On July 1st, 1988, almost three and a half years after the appeal started, the court again ruled in favor of Abby Conant. For the first time in over six years, she finally regained her solo trombone position. But the Munich Philharmonic wasn't finished just yet, for they had some more tricks up their sleeves. Even though she was reinstated as solo trombonist, Abby knew she could still take her employer to court if they played any more games. And play more games, they did, by targeting her financial benefits. This included refusing to deliver her back pay costing roughly $17,500, refusing to pay her as solo trombonist, placing her in a lower salary group than her male counterparts, and not placing her in something called automatic maximum seniority. All this added up to her getting $1,000 less per month than her first chair colleagues. And it wasn't just her finances. Despite the court mandate, the orchestra found loop pulls in the contract to keep her out of first chair quite often. But after the appeal, the orchestra was then left with three solo trombonists, including Dankfart Schmidt and Danny Boven. Rather than let the orchestra fill in the missing second chair themselves, the three agreed to share the role of second as long as Abby received equal treatment. For once, Abby was getting support from her section mates. But even before that compromise could be communicated with the orchestra, Dankfart Schmidt said that he agreed to play second trombone full-time. This was because the orchestra chairman had to put him under a great deal of pressure. They were not interested in a permanent solution, but in having a temporary second until Abby left due to discrimination. While Abby was requesting the chairman not to make her play lower parts, someone walked by, not knowing what was being discussed, and said this. Do you know what the difference between a woman and a toilet is? You don't have to kiss a toilet when you're through with it. One of the chairmen laughed at it. On July 12th, 1990, she wrote to the Women's Equal Treatment Office and asked them for her to receive equal treatment. They responded 15 days later saying they couldn't because it would take supernatural powers to change a self-contented patriarch like Chilibadaki. She recommended Miss Conant wait until a more woman friendly conductor takes over the rudder, something she was not willing to do. A month and a half later, Abby met with the director of the Women's Equal Treatment Office, who explained that Chilebadaki threatens to leave when things don't go his way. The office director also said she will talk to the mayor of Munich, known as Lord Mayor Koronovitter, and recommended that she reach out to him as well. On October 15th, William Osborne wrote a letter to Mayor Koronovitter, basically saying, my wife isn't getting equal treatment. Oh, and also back in April, Chilebadaki said this to the orchestra's string section, you sound like a ladies' orchestra. The mayor wouldn't respond until November 5th. 
his response basically said, I understand how that could be offensive to women. I'm gonna look into this and get back to you. He never did. On November 5th, Abby met with some authority figures representing the city of Munich and the orchestra, requesting she get the same seniority payment her colleagues were getting. They refused. With yet another failed attempt at a friendly settlement and no help from the mayor himself, Abby Conant reopened her case against the city of Munich. The first hearing took place on January 23rd, 1991, but this time, note that the judge was a woman, Angelica Mack. In the first hearing, the orchestra argued that Abby has no reason to argue because there are other first chairs in the same pay group number three, but they couldn't prove that this was true because they didn't reference their own employer records. The judge inferred that this dispute wasn't just about equal pay, but also equal treatment. She said to both parties that this news cannot go out into the press, that a compromise must be reached, and scheduled the next hearing to take place just two months later on March 8th. At that second hearing, the orchestra Orchestra offered to place Abby in salary group 4, which pays about $280 more per month, but not give her automatic maximum seniority, which was created in 1987 and given to every principal but her. She refused the offer. Abby made a second attempt at getting a meaningful response from Mayor Corona with her in a letter sent on January 31st. He didn't respond until a month and a half later, saying that he refused, stating, despite well knowing about the matter before the case opened, I can't interfere in a pending case. At the third hearing on April 22nd, the orchestra explained to Abby how the pay categorizations worked. Their choice of words made Abby kind of sus, not gonna lie, so she met with a young and new orchestra chairman who agreed to secretly investigate her pay rate and came back with some bad news. She was getting paid less than all her solo costs colleagues. Her union lawyer then notified the court. At the last hearing on June 7th, the judge said that Abby was being treated indecently, and that because equal treatment laws had been broken, ordered the orchestra to place her in pay group 4. However, the judge said that Abby could not receive the maximum seniority payments. This was because Abby's union lawyer twice failed to provide the list of criteria that explained how you actually get that seniority level, something the orchestra successfully withheld from the court. The judge told her that she would like to rule differently, but couldn't, saying, don't say this ruling is quite as bad as your employer. She also told them to settle the matter outside of court one last time. They refused. For the first time, at least partially, the court ruled in the favor of the orchestra. Abby Conant, running out of options and patience, took to the press. On October 28, 1991, Der Spiegel, Germany's largest news website, featured a three-page long article about Abby's story. This story circulated all over the planet. In the article, the orchestra's leadership argued the boss doesn't mind women and that he pays all men and women the same. Conversely, Abby stated, I am dealing with unscrupulous people. It is a nightmare. Please help me. Her story was also shared in a spring 1992 issue of the ITA Journal, but at the same time, the Munich Philharmonic turned to crisis management. In the February-March 1992 edition of the Orchestra Magazine, cellist Jörg Egebrecht denied Abby's claims. Quote, There can be no discussion that the maestro is a sexist. In him, an unobstructed masculine aura is projected that is not corruptible. Then on June 28th, Mayor Lord Koronowitzer gave Chilabadaki the award Honorable Citizen. Abby then released her lawyer that just represented her, and a different lawyer that represented her in earlier trials never mentioned anything about back pay. As a result, she lost $30,000 for good. Abby used her insurance to hire a lawyer specializing in sexual discrimination, and also appealed the court's decision regarding seniority, and the orchestra appealed the decision to pull her back out of pay group 4. Abby and William, now having zero reason to contact the mayor again, failed to get in contact with the Women's Equal Treatment Office and the Green Party's vice mayor. They were now almost completely on their own. Things got tense. During a tour in Hong Kong in October of 1992, a stage manager told her that she was playing assistant first chair. She asked him, is someone sick? He said no. Eric Terwilliger, the principal horn of the orchestra, overheard this and said to Abby, don't do it. None of us have to. Why should you? Abby then told the stage manager, I'm not playing. The orchestra chairman and highest administrator stormed up to her. The administrator sternly commanded, You are ordered to play assistant. You must immediately go on the stage. No discussion. Abby replied, I don't want to discuss it either, and left. The administrator decided to fire Abby right there and then and send her on a plane home, but he needed a second signature from another chairman, so he called one in Munich. The chairman from Munich felt that firing Abby would be problematic, so he called the German Musicians Union, who said that is not a good reason for firing her. As a result, the termination letter never got the second signature. The orchestra's administrator administration then began a campaign to consistently harass her by calling her and sending her letters, threatening her that if she doesn't play second trombone, steps would be taken. It got to the point where she became afraid to answer the 
door or telephone. Then the appeal hearing happened on October 21st. At this hearing, the personal manager of the city of Munich was subpoenaed by the court to appear. The judge told him, if you lie to me at all, 15 years in prison. With his hands trembling, he confirmed to the judge that Abby still was not in the same pay group as her solo colleagues, and that the seniority level was made to obtain a partnership with the Bavarian State Radio Orchestra. Abby's new lawyer forced the city to provide the evaluations that handed every other soloist the seniority level. The judge then read it and revealed that Abby was qualified for maximum seniority from the beginning. And finally, on March 10th, 1993, it was over. The judge ruled that Abby have the same seniority level and pay group as her solo colleagues, but due to a statute of limitations to only get back pay dating to September 1st, 1988. Five days later, Abby had her last meeting with the Munich Philharmonic. In attendance were Abby, her lawyer, representatives of the city personnel office, the orchestra's administration, and as the veto of her first trial year was announced 12 years ago, bass trombonist Robert Meissner. They told her, pointing out newspaper clippings of Miriam, that she needed permission to play outside the Munich Philharmonic. She told them no one else needs this permission, and that would create problems. They threatened to fire her if she didn't play second. Her lawyer said she would just go to court and regain her position. And finally, they offered to meet with her lawyer and negotiate a settlement. Abby just smiled. When the meeting ended, everyone shook Abby's hand and asked her to not take any of their actions personally. Abby motioned to shake Robert Meissner's hand, but he refused because, to the embarrassment of the other representatives, that he was not obligated to do so. Her lawyer required them to give her a severance word, to never make her play for the Philharmonic except a solo trombonist, and to deliver all of her back pay by May 31st, 1993. That ended up being the same day that a review of her performance of Miriam played at the International Women's Brass Conference in St. Louis, Missouri, was posted. It stated that the audience had already known about the story and that their reaction to her performance was ecstatic. She then got invitations to perform and speak at several prestigious American universities. For the first time since 1982, Abby Conant had her life back. If you guys enjoyed this video, hit the like button and subscribe for more content coming soon. If you want to support the creation of these videos, consider becoming a Patreon subscriber or buying any of my merch linked below. I also have a Discord server if any of you want to chat with me. That will be all for today. Thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you in the next one.